Good evening, everyone. Welcome and uh, thank you for joining us for the virtual U Miami Health Talk. Tonight's topic is brain health, memory loss, and dementia during quarantine. I will be your moderator for this evening, health journalist Ileana Bravo. We're very happy that you're with us this evening. Um, and of course, tonight's U Miami Health Talk is presented by U Health Virtual Clinics because you health expert providers are ready to care for you, whether it's in our facilities or virtually, it's wherever you are. We invite you to learn more about the measures we have in place to keep you safe, as well as your appointment scheduling options by visiting youhealthvirtualclinics.org. There you can learn more about all the steps we've taken. Tonight, we're going to hear from you health physician expert, Dr. James Galvin. Dr. Galvin will present on brain health, memory loss, and dementia during quarantine. He will differentiate healthy brain aging from early memory loss and dementia, discuss how COVID-19 and social distancing has affected people with memory loss and dementia, and he will describe steps you can take to improve your brain health. Now we remind you that we are going to poll the audience uh, on questions relevant to our discussion tonight and we invite you to be interactive and participate uh, by answering the multiple choice questions. Uh, also, we invite you to participate in giving us questions that you would like to pose to our expert provider tonight. Some of you have done it already in advance, but others go into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen and it will be anonymous. There's plenty of time for you to do it during our discussion. So take your time and bring us your questions. And we are going to ask Dr. Galvin at the end of the presentation. And that leads us to our presenter this evening, Dr. James Galvin, who is a bird board certified neurologist at U Health. He completed his fellowship training at New Jersey Medical School, Rutgers. Dr. Galvin's clinical specialties include memory and cognitive disorders. Now, of course, you know that U Health has locations throughout South Florida from South Miami Day to Palm Beach. Dr. Galvin is the chief of cognitive neurology at U Health in Palm Beach and Broward County. And again, he's going to be presenting on brain health, memory loss, and dementia during quarantine. But that leads us to our very first poll question of the evening. So we get a, get a feel for all of you out in the audience and what uh, your thoughts are. Here's the first poll question. When was your most recent visit to the neurologist? Was it less than a year ago, one to three years ago, more than three years ago, or never? So please respond. We'll give you plenty of time to do so before Dr. Galvin starts his presentation. When was your most recent visit to a neurologist? Was it less than a year ago? Was it one to three years ago, more than three years, or never? And as soon as we see, and there are the responses, I guess, Dr. Galvin, you can see them along with me so that you can start your presentation based on some of this data. Great. Well, thank you, Liana. It's very nice to see everybody, or hope everybody can see me. Um, we're going to uh, now begin our presentation. Um, and so what I thought I would do is cover sort of three different topics. Um, so one, talk a little bit about brain health and, and Alzheimer's disease and related disorders, uh, and then segue into how COVID may be affecting patients and family members. Um, and then the last part of the talk, really focusing on how you, what you can do to improve your brain health, as was mentioned before. So before we start, I thought we would talk a little bit about what healthy brain aging looks like. Um, so when I talk about healthy brain aging, what I mean is the absence of any cognitive decline or cognitive changes. And this can occur well into the 10th decade of life. Uh, people who have healthy brains can still carry out their activities of daily living and lead a productive and happy life. Now, they may have some physical limitations, so things that inhibit them or prohibit them from doing the things that they'd like to do. But outside of those physical limitations, uh, their brain still functions to the point where they'd be able to carry out their every acti everyday activities. Now, with age, it does take us a lot longer to do things, so our processing speed slows down. It takes us longer to remember things or recall information, but it usually comes back to us with a little bit of a delay. Uh, and so the key point I wanted to draw, take home tonight is that memory loss is not part of the normal aging process. 
memory loss is caused by something, and if whatever that something is deserves to be ev evaluated. Uh, in the first poll question, we can see there was about an even distribution of people who have seen a neurologist recently, who have seen someone in the remote past, and someone who's never seen a neurologist before. So it's a nice balanced group. Uh, next, I thought I would talk a little bit about the term dementia. Um, and dementia is really a general word. Uh, it's describing a collection of problems. It means a change in memory and other thinking abilities that interferes with everyday function and, and is not caused specifically by another condition. Um, so it, but it's a general word. So it's not really a diagnosis. People shouldn't be diagnosed with dementia. They should be diagnosed with the cause of dementia. Um, and so if you think about it in a slightly different way, dementia is like the word car. Uh, car is a four wheeled vehicle, usually using gasoline. It gets us from one place to another, but there are lots and lots of different types of cars, right? There are Chevys and Hondas and Mercedes and Lamborghinis. Um, there are pickup trucks and SUVs and minivans. So there are lots and lots of different types of cars. Now they're all cars, but they're different types. Same way, there are over 100 different causes of dementia. They're all different. They all cause the same syndrome or collection of symptoms, that is memory and thinking problems, but they're different diseases. Um, I just wanted to give you a broad perspective of just of some of the many, many, many conditions. I couldn't get them all on one slide. It would be a slide that would be difficult to read. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. I just highlight that when someone comes to see a neurologist for a memory problem, um, we, what, what we have to do is figure out which one of these conditions may be causing the dementia because our approach is gonna be very, very, very different. Um, and, and so it's really important that we take the time to think about how we can figure out what the cause of dementia is, what the risk factors for that person is, and what's the best treatment for that person. I think now we jump to another polling question. Yes, Eliana? Yes, perfect, Dr. Galvin. So here's the question on the screen for all of you to answer. Have you or a loved one been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's? It's a yes or no question. Have you or a loved one been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's? And I remind you to continue to send your questions to our speaker using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's that little dialogue boxes all the way at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And there you go, doctor. Okay. Well, <clears throat> um, I should mention in case you have to have to have it, I, I, I have parrots and so sometimes they decide to squawk and one just squawks. So if you hear a weird sound, it's, it's my parrots. Um, they don't listen to me. My children don't listen to me, but my parrots really don't listen to me. Um, so we talked about healthy brain aging. We talked about dementia. Now let's talk about the most common cause of dementia, and that is Alzheimer's disease. Um, it affects about 5.7 million Americans. Most people are over the age of 65, but about a quarter million are under the age of 65. Okay, uh, We call that early onset disease. Um, the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. So as the population gets older, the risk of Alzheimer's disease increases. Uh, at age 65, it's about 2%. By age 85, it's up to 42%. That sounds like a scary number. Um, you know, that means about four out of every 10 older adults are at risk for having Alzheimer's disease. Of course, the flip side is that means six out of every 10 don't develop disease. And so we're gonna talk at the end of the talk about what you could do to protect and protect your brain and try to redu you know, reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I think that that's a really relevant topic. Um, it's a very expensive disease. It's the third most expensive disease in the United States after heart disease and cancer with total cost over $200 billion annually. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States in older adults. And it's the number one reason why people enter the nursing home. Um, and the median cost of nursing home care today approaches almost $100,000 a year. So um, it's really a disease that not only affects the patient and the family, but affects society as a whole because of the cost that uh, the disease uh, uh, brings about. Um, this is really relevant in Florida. 
So Florida is the third most populous state, as you know, um, but it's a state that has a lot of older adults. It has six and a half percent of all Medicare beneficiaries. That's number one in the country of, of the 50 states. Um, there are about a half million cases or so in 2019, and three quarter of a million cases are projected by the year 2025. Um, now, when you think about per capita cases, so thinking about cases based on the total population, again, that puts us at number one in the United States. Um, so it, it's a disease that really affects everybody, both directly and indirectly. Many people will know someone who has Alzheimer's disease, or you may be taking care of someone who has Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what are some of the signs and symptoms of the disease? Um, well, at the mild stage, the typical symptom that someone may present with is, is forgetfulness. So that they learn, they hear something, they don't remember it, and then they ask questions about it or they forget that they've heard it before. This may manifest in a lot of different ways. They may repeat themselves. They search for words. They forget appointments. Um, they may have difficulty with attention. If they're still working, they may have difficulty on the job. Uh, and they may have some mild mood changes, some depression and some apathy or loss of interest in their activities. At the moderate stage, all the mild symptoms get worse and now you see more disorientation and increased memory loss. Uh, you start to see a lot of difficulty with the what we call the instrumental activities of daily living, cooking, cleaning, doing their banking. Um, and as this progresses into the severe stages, all these symptoms get worse, and now you see a lot more behavioral symptoms. So agitation, aggression. Um, you also see changes in walking and toileting, uh, which leads many people to have to transition from their home to a higher level of care. Uh, so the disease is progressive, and over time, the symptoms increase. Now, it's a challenging world out there, right? We're all dealing with COVID and we're trying to figure out how to do this social distancing. And, and I don't like the word social distancing. And, and my chair of neurology says that he likes to say you're physically distanced, but you don't have to be socially distanced. Um, and I believe that that's true. So COVID d does a lot of things. And there's, you know, there's lots and lots of symptoms that have been described. And I think over time, research will show us more about what the both the short and long-term ramifications of COVID is. Um, in terms of COVID's effect on the brain, we're just beginning to understand that COVID appears to have some vascular complications affecting the small blood vessels of the heart, of the organs, and of the brain. Um, but we really don't know the full extent of that. But I, I think there are some special considerations when we think about the current COVID environment for older adults in general and for persons living with dementia. That is, there's a higher susceptibility to diseases, particularly diseases like pneumonia. Uh, so given that COVID is a respiratory illness, there probably is a much higher susceptibility in patients with dementia. Um, patients with dementia tend to have higher complication rates regardless of the illness that they get. And that seems to be true, particularly for COVID. Uh, so many of the the high complications and high mortality rates that we've heard have occurred in nursing home populations. And as I mentioned before, the number one reason why people enter a nursing home tends to be due to dementia. Uh, so there seems to be a lot of significant complications uh, with COVID. The other thing though, and I think that this is important for people, is that now that a lot of people are practicing social distancing, that there really is a disruption of the routine. Um, so all of the activities and all the ways that we've worked on trying to improve the care for our patients, uh, this idea of, of being sort of quarantined within your home and not engaging with people has really changed the, the nature of how we care for people. And there are many doctors who are hearing stories from their patients and from the families that there's a higher risk of confusion and behavioral changes in the patients. Uh, think about this. There's no adult day programs. Uh, there are no community programs. If they're in a skilled nursing facility, there are no visitors allowed. Um, and you're wearing masks and face shields. Now, you have to wear a mask to protect yourself. But think about the person who has dementia. They're seeing everybody that they recognize. And now those people are wearing masks. It can be very confusing and at times frightening. And this could lead to some behavioral changes 
and delirium or confusion. Um, you know, while there's no remedy to the problem as a whole, um, I think some useful steps are, are really common sense. What you'd like to do is to try to normalize routines as much as possible. So where you can develop a routine, try to develop that routine and follow it. But routines are very comforting for people. It's something they can rely on. In particular, patients with dementia often rely on a routine to help them get through the day. Um, and when that routine is disrupted, it really leads to some increased confusion. Um, what you might want to do is try to recreate some of those programs at home. So if, they, if someone was going to an adult day program and they had art program or music programs, then why can't you do something like that at home? Uh, so try to recreate that program to increase the comfort. Um, and then just like we're doing a virtual meeting today, there's try to do virtual visits with family and friends. Um, my grandmother's 99 years old and just uh, several months ago she fell and she broke her hip. Uh, so she was in the hospital and she's been in the rehab hospital uh, now for over two months. Um, and my mother who lives with my grandmother um, does virtual visits and so they are constantly bringing her little phone and, and let her communicate by phone and by, by the iPad so that she can see my mother and speak with her. Uh, because my mother can only go to the nursing home twice a week for 15 minutes and it has to be behind a plexiglass uh, window. Uh, so for my grandmother who lived with my mother, this is a big change. Uh, so one of the ways to address it is to try to think about how to change that. And these virtual visits, I think, can play a big role. Um, so as we shift now to think about what we can do to protect our brains as we get older, and that's going to be the focus of the rest of our talk, um, I think it's important to understand the things that put us at risk and the things that may protect us. Um, and there are things we can modify and there are things that can't be modified. So the things we can't modify are things like age, sex, and family history. So you, you can't change those things. Um, and, and so I don't worry about those things in and of themselves. But there, we know there are a lot of risk factors for which we have so, at least some control over. Um, so people with low educational attainment and low cognitive activities are seem to be at a higher risk. People with an increased body mass index or obesity, people with diabetes, people with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, depression, uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, brain injury, uh, substance use, and hearing loss are all things that seem to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what's important about these things is as that it is possible that we could do things to try to reduce the risk of disease. There are also things we now know that are protective. There are things that, and I'll show you some evidence for this, there are things that can be done that for people who are doing them, they seem to reduce the risk of developing dementia. So staying socially active, physically active, cognitively active, being mindful and eating a heart healthy diet. All these things can significantly contribute uh, to reducing the overall risk of disease. What's important about this is all of these factors that I talked about, when you look at the overall risk of people developing Alzheimer's disease, and you take away those things that you can't modify, about up to 40% of the actual risk are things that we have the possibility of modifying, changing, um, affecting by our behaviors, our lifestyle, of uh, going to our doctor, controlling our comorbid diseases. So there are many, many different things that, that we can do to try to reduce our risk. So, so what can you do? What are some things that you can do? So the first thing is think about what we can do to try to improve our memory. Um, so one, we can write things down. Um, you know, if you write things down and make a list, you're much more likely to remember things. Think about if you have to go shopping, and if you only need to pick up two or three things, you might be able to remember that. But if you need to do a major shopping for an event and you needed 50 different items, um, you're probably going to be more effective if you use a list. So just like we use a list for shopping, maybe we'd want to use a list for other things to help us. Um, using memo pads. Uh, so place them around the house at key places where you might look at them. Um, for example, in the kitchen, um, by the telephone if you still have a landline. Um, 
If you're old fashioned, you can use a, an appointment book. You know, if you got a little black appointment book we used to keep in our pockets, or if you're tech savvy, you can use a smartphone. Um, and you can create lists on your smartphone. You can use your calendar for reminders. So there are lots of different things that you can do to try to help yourself. Um, the other thing you can do uh, if you have to learn new information, one is to try to pay attention. If you're not paying attention, your chance of remembering something is really quite small. The second step is to rehearse and repeat. In general, if you can repeat something for seven times, um, you're much more likely to remember it. So if someone gave you a phone number, repeating the phone number at least seven times will increase your ability to recall that number. And another thing to do is to try to associate information with other things, what we call memory hooks. Um, so if you wanted to remember me, for example, um, you might remember me as a person that you heard a talk about dementia. So you could tie the name to the event in University of Miami, and those hooks make it easier to recall information. We could play games. So this was an interesting study done in New York a number of years ago, but I think it's still a relevant study. And I like this one because I think it, it, it highlights the types of things that people can do. So this was a study done in Bronx, New York, and they looked at people who played chess and checkers, backgammon, cards, uh, and they compared people who played games versus people who didn't play games. And, and there was about almost a two-fold risk reduction in developing dementia. The people who played games had 1.6 less risk of developing dementia than people who didn't play games. Okay. So we have another poll. We have another poll question. Right, and that is, have you been isolated during the pandemic? This is one that so many of us can relate to. Have you been isolated during the pandemic? It's a yes or no, and please answer it on the screen. The, you, you can tick the yes or the no. Some of you are going into the Q&A feature to answer it there. Sorry if we confused you, but uh, you should answer it directly onto your screen. Have you been isolated during the pandemic? Yes or no? Okay, and our results are coming up soon. And let's see what we got. 67% said yes. Not surprisingly, 33% said no, Dr. Galvin. Right. So, you know, we, we talked about the isolation and the social distancing, the physical distancing. And so, you know, you want to think about things that you can do to try to protect your brain. Uh, the slide I showed just previously are a lot of games that people can play by themselves. Uh, but also think about how you can play these games uh, online or in small groups using appropriate uh, protective uh, equipment. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can exercise. Um, and so this was an interesting study done and they looked at people who exercise and exercise was defined at three times per week with an intensity greater than brisk walking. So not really crazy exercises, but, you know, a good strong walk or a jog or bicycling or other types of activities three times a day led to up to a 50% risk reduction um, for developing dementia. Um, so playing a game, exercising, each of those are having an effect in reducing our risk. Um, now, this is an interesting study, and I wanted to show you this because I, I know people are isolated right now. Um, but this was study was done by a colleague of mine in Chicago. And what they did was they thought about life as a series of concentric circles, like a bullseye. Um, and in the middle, the bullseye is your bedroom. And then each circle is farther and farther away from your bedroom. So being on your porch, being out in your yard, being out of your house and in your neighborhood, being out of your neighborhood, being outside town. And what they found was people that crossed at least six zones in a week had a lower risk of dementia. Now, we're isolated right now, but think about what you did before COVID and think about what you're gonna do after COVID and how you can figure out social engagement because that interaction and getting outside the home and interacting with the world not only seems to be fun, but actually may help protect your brain. How about diet? Um, now, by diet, I don't mean like dieting and trying to lose weight. I'm talking about what you eat, your nutritional patterns. 
Um, and so this was a study that looked at a Mediterranean style diet. So Mediterranean diet is a diet that's high in whole, whole foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, cereals, lean meats like fish, olive oil, um, a little bit of red wine, um, and very low in saturated fats and processed foods. Um, and what the study showed was that for people who had disease, so if someone they already had Alzheimer's disease or an, a mild cognitive impairment, their progression was much slower uh, eating this diet. And for people who ate the diet, uh, they seemed to have a lower risk. So the dietary factors seem to, to be protective. Now, all of these things I'm talking about, I, I want you to realize that they're not absolute. So there are people in the Mediterranean who eat a Mediterranean diet who may still develop Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at the population as a whole, following a Mediterranean diet has benefits above and beyond sort of a, a Western diet that has lots of processed foods. Now you're saying, well, what happens if I do more than one thing? What happens if I diet and I exercise? Well, not surprisingly, the benefits may be even greater. So if you looked at people who had no exercise and didn't eat a healthy diet, compared to people who exercised and had a healthy diet, they had a much lower risk of developing disease. So combining these things is going to have a greater effect than doing any one of them alone. Um, and again, this is important because we want to think about not just what the world is like now, but in the new norm, I think that's the word that people use, the new norm, uh, when we're back in engaging in, with each other, how are we going to socialize? What dietary choices are we going to make? What exercise patterns are we going to take? What are we going to do to protect our brain health? Um, I want to give you just this big this picture. So this is a study called the finger study. Um, it was it's being done in Finland. Um, and it's been going on for about two years now. And now there's something called the worldwide finger study, which just like it sounds is finger done in lots of different countries. Um, and, and these investigators took a lot of the ideas that I was talking about and put them all together. So they looked at all of the risk factors, so obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure and smoking, um, and they took all of the protective factors, physical activity and cognitive activity and education, and they said, what happens if we tried to reduce risk factors and promote protective factors? And so what they did was they randomized people into different groups, um, and the people that were in the active group uh, they got nutritional counseling and an exercise program and a cognitive activities program and intense management of their medical conditions. And the other people just got their routine care. Um, and so the hypothesis is the people in the in intensive intervention are going to be less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now, we don't know the results of this, um, but these studies and other studies, including studies we're doing at the University of Miami, suggests that these type of interventions may actually promote brain health and reduce the risk of developing dementia. Uh, the program that we have at the University of Miami, we call the Healthy Brain Initiative. Um, and so this is a research program with volunteers who agree to come in for annual assessments. And, and when they come in, we do a very deep characterization. So it's called deep phenotyping. That means we try to get, learn everything we possibly can about you. Uh, we do a clinical assessment and a cognitive assessment and a social assessment and a psychological assessment. Um, we look at your physical activity and your, uh, your diet. Um, and what we do is we try to create an individualized risk profile. So we look at you as an individual and try to figure out what are the things that put you at higher risk, what are the things that put you at lower risk, and develop an intervention that you can follow on your own um, and then see if you're able to follow it. Right? And then we give you some guidance, but really the idea is that, you know, can you take this plan that's personalized for you and follow it? And that's a little bit different than the, what I showed you before, which is everybody gets the same plan and everybody does the same thing and either you do it or you don't do it. Um, ours is more, of a once, is a more of a personalized approach where we're designing it specifically for you. Um, I wanted to show you just a little bit of the data that we've had so far. Um, and so I know this is a busy plot, it's called the spaghetti plot. So each line is a different person. Um, 
and there were three different types of people on the plot. In orange are people who came to us and they do not have any evidence of a dementia. In blue are the people who have very mild changes. And in green are the people who are already diagnosed with a dementia. And what we found was for the people who had no dementia, their memory was improving with these interventions. For the people who had mild memory changes, their memory was largely improving or stabilizing. For the people who already had dementia, they didn't improve. So while there's, there was some slowing in their cognitive loss, uh, they continued to decline. Um, and this also tells us that not only do we have to do these things, but there are windows of opportunity where they could be most effective. So coming into us when you're beginning to notice the very earliest signs of change, we're likely to do a lot more than if you come to us when it's at the moderate to some more or some more severe stages of disease where we can still help, but the capacity of us to show improvement or stabilization is much lower. Um, so these windows are important. And I think as we learn more and more about how we're gonna intervene with people, uh, we, we can try to improve upon these programs. There are other things we do. Um, so we've done programs to look at mindfulness and lifestyle. So this is a chair yoga program. So these are people with Alzheimer's disease um, and they have various amounts of physical abilities. So some people need to use the chair to stabilize themselves and other people can stand freely. So we've adapted yoga for older adults and what we showed was a significant improvement in quality of life. Um, we did a program that we had to stop with COVID coming, but we hope to restart once uh, we're allowed to start interacting with people, looking at ballroom dancing. Um, so I don't have any results to show you, but there's a lot of evidence that ballroom dancing with its really intense physical activity and its social engagement may uh, improve brain function. Um, on August 24th, so coming up in two weeks, uh, we're doing a little worldwide event called Hula for Health. Um, and so we're having a worldwide Hula uh, show um, and people are encouraged to film themselves doing hula and sharing it on Facebook. Uh, and we have people uh, signed up from all over the world uh, to do this. Um, we've also looked at other approaches, so alternative medicine approaches. So this was an acupuncture study we did. So we looked at people with very mild cognitive impairment and we conducted eight weeks of acupuncture. And what we showed was a significant improvement in cognition, in mood, in mindfulness and in overall physical performance. Um, so, you know, it's not just medicines. It really is thinking about lifestyle as a whole and how we can improve uh, what we're doing and who we are, really to become the best us that we can be. So to summarize uh, our talk today, um, there are multiple ways that we can potentially be at risk for Alzheimer's disease. That sounds scary, but that means there are also multiple ways that we can try to treat, prevent, or cure the disease. Uh, there are a lot of clues out there, and we're just beginning to understand how we can maximize the information that we get and design plans that are specific for people. Uh, we have found, and many other people have found, that efforts to treat or prevent or cure may be much more successful if, one, we really take a multimodal approach, not just say, exercise, that's it is but try to think of you as a whole and think about all the problems and then also direct those programs at people at risk. Um, we think there's a number of modifiable risk factors that really are excellent targets, a lifestyle, environment, comorbid disease or coexisting disease. So we can think about Alzheimer's and related disorders or really diseases that occur over the course of a lifetime. So that means they're really ways that we can build a better brain as we age or to say it uh, more eloquently, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's Benjamin Franklin in 1735. Now to be fair to Benjamin Franklin, he was talking about they should have more volunteer firehouses to try to prevent house fires, but I think it's still relevant for our brain health as well. Um, I showed you a little bit of research data. I just want to quickly acknowledge I, I, I have the fortune of working with wonderful people, both at the University of Miami and at universities around the world, 
uh, and our efforts are supported by the National Institutes of Health and several private foundations. Um, if you'd like to find out more about what we do, um, you know, here's our email, um, healthybrain at miami.edu, um, and someone will get back to you. Um, with COVID right now, we're, we're still trying to figure out how to get our office all up and running. Um, so that's been a little bit of a challenge, as is in many places. But, it, but if you'd like to find out more information or find out about scheduling appointments for either clinical care or for research participation, you know, please feel free to email us. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I think we're going to open it up for questions and turn it back to you, Eliana. Thank you, Dr. Galvin, and uh, could not be a more timely topic, which is why all of our participants and attendees are hanging in um, and listening to your every word. So let's start with the Q&A session. And this first question, somewhat of an in-depth question, comes to us from Candice. I'm wondering if what we accept as a natural sign of aging is truly due to the physiological aging of our brains and biological system, or if we just assume it's natural because it happens often as people age. In short, is it just a correlation or is it a causation? If the correlation cannot be proven, then what are the causal root factors that contribute to memory loss and is there a remedy for them? That's a mouthful. Um, yeah. You know, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a trick. Um, so when when people get asked complex questions, what they usually do is they look at the camera and say, "That was a great question." Uh, and the reason we do that is we're trying to pause and formulate an answer. So I'll give you a little trick, um, uh, or giving away a secret. Um, but what we know is that memory changes are not a function of age. Slow processing speed is a function of age. Memory changes are a function of disease. Um, and so we know that that is causative. It's not a correlation, it's causative. So diseases like Alzheimer's disease uh, have pathologies that begin 20 years before people have symptoms. Um, and over time, as that pathology increases, it causes a degeneration of brain cells. Uh, and when there's enough degeneration of brain cells, people have symptoms. Um, and so there's a direct relation, causative relationship. Um, what we don't know necessarily are what the root causes are of these diseases. What we are understanding more and more about are these risk factors, some of which are modifiable. So uh, outside of age, one of the strongest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease is diabetes. Diabetes affects not only the sugar, which people tend to focus on, but actually affects all of the small blood vessels that feed the brain, the heart, and other organs. Um, and so if you look at people with diabetes, they have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And when you look at their brains at autopsy, they have much more vascular pathology than people without diabetes. So we're learning more and more every day. Uh, but again, it's not a, just a simple correlation or an association. Uh, we know that this is causative. Alzheimer's causes these memory changes. Age does not. Is there a genetic component to Alzheimer's disease that we have found in any of the research? We often hear so much, my mother had Alzheimer's, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. Oh my gosh, am I at greater risk? All right. So I'm going to answer this in two ways. So first, um, the genetic basis of the disease, as, as is it inherited, um, is rare. Only about 2% of dementia cases are genetic. That is, there's a gene that causes the disease. Okay? And those genetic forms of the disease tend to be early onset, so people in their 40s and 50s tend to have unusual and aggressive presentations and tend to be very genetic. That is, every generation is affected and they're all affected the same way. So great grandmom, granddad, mom, four aunts, three cousins, and they all got it at age 54. Um, so it, it's very genetic. That's rare. The other flip side is what we call risk. And so there are genes that increase the risk of dementia. And of course, you get genes from your parents. So if your parents carry a risk gene and they develop the disease, and they may pass the risk gene on to you, that increases your risk. But risk genes do not cause disease. They just increase the risk of disease. So there are people with risk genes that never develop disease, 
and there are people without risk genes that do develop disease. And because of this, is, is, is it worth having genetic testing for it? So generally, it's not worth having genetic testing unless you're really, really curious uh, because there's nothing specifically we're going to do about that risk. We do genetic testing and research all the time because when we do the analyses, we want to be able to control for the genetic risk factors. But on a clinical perspective, there's really nothing you can do with that information. Um, and it does put you at risk if it's in your medical record for discovery, um, which could put you at a lower candidate uh, for insurance products, for example. So uh, we generally don't encourage genetic testing um, in clinical settings unless one, we've had a good discussion and you understand the pros and cons of it. And two, we can provide some genetic counseling. But I think just ordering a genetic test in clinic is probably not a good idea. Dr. Galvin, this is one that I think everyone is feeling. I feel like my mind is changing rapidly since the virus. Mm -hmm. I'll be 70 in a few months. Is this normal that I'm feeling this way? Again, I, I think one of the challenges is that you know, depending on what you've done during the quarantine, um, you know, if you really socially and physically distance yourself from people and you're spending all your time by yourself in your house, um, you know, you're really not getting the cognitive stimulation that your brain thrives on. Um, and this is where finding ways of virtually connecting um, is important or, or do if you're going to physically connect, make sure that you're taking precautions you know, wear your mask, you know, stay six feet apart, try to do it in outdoor settings, et cetera. Um, but I, I hear this from a lot of people. They feel that the, the pandemic and the isolation associated with the pandemic has really, you know, put them in a setback and put them in a loop. Um, and, you know, I encourage people to try to do everything they can to keep their brains active. Um, and not just passive activity, but, but active activities in order to, to keep stimulated. Dr. Galvin, what medications are effective in slowing the progression of dementia? And I guess right. we're talking proven ones. Right. So, so there are four medicines approved in the United States for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, they act to slow down the symptoms of the disease, but they don't slow the progression of the disease. There are currently no medications that address the underlying disease process. Now, you may have read um, in the newspapers and in the news uh, that a drug has been, an application has been put at the Food and Drug Administration for a biological uh, drug, um, an antibody. Um, and if approved, that would be the first medicine that could potentially modify the disease. But right now, we don't have anything medication-wise that can slow the progression of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, doctor, uh, please discuss the effects of chemotherapy on memory. How long could those effects occur and, for, and last? Right. Um, so, you know, uh, that's a great question. So um, I, I think... It's difficult to give a, a, an easy answer because chemotherapy entails hundreds and hundreds of different agents um, and due to lots and lots of different causes, right? So um, chemotherapeutic agents work by affecting cells that are rapidly dividing. Um, the brain doesn't divide. Uh, so the brain is a mature organ. It doesn't have a lot of replication capabilities. Um, but most chemotherapeutic agents have other side effects associated with them. And so some of them will affect the brain, some of them will affect the heart, some of them will affect the nerves, some of them will affect the blood vessels. So some chemotherapeutic agents can affect the brain. Um, and if they do, people can have various symptoms, including memory loss um, associated with that. Um, if the chemotherapy is discontinued, you know, so you finished your cycle, people can recover uh, from the effects, although some people are la left with lasting effects. Um, some people require longer term chemotherapy, and the longer the term and the higher the doses of drugs that can affect the brain, the more likely there is to be symptoms. 
So I think speaking with your doctor is always important if you're noticing some changes from chemotherapy. I, I can't give a specific answer because it, it can vary so much by individual. Okay. Um, this is one that um, we've heard, and, and this has nothing to do with politics, but what are the tests that can determine a diagnosis of dementia? How can dementia versus Alzheimer's be determined? And I, I speak politically because I know that uh, it mm -hmm. has been thrown around that the president right. had some testing done, and right. what, what does that entail? Right. So there, there are several different ways to do it, right? So the first way are things we call screening tests. So these are tests, they're brief, uh, they give us a quick snapshot um, of how someone's doing. Um, and so an example of this would be the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which is the test that President Trump seems to, be have, seems to have referred to. Um, these tests are designed as a quick screening test. Um, they're fairly easy. Um, and so the idea is that we're not worried about how good you do. That's irrelevant. Um, what, we're, what we're interested in is if you don't do well, how, well, how not well you do. Um, so they're designed to pick up a problem. They're not designed to test how smart you are. Um, and, and so these tests, you know, the scores get lower if you have more problems. Um, uh, and so doctors can do these tests quickly in their office. They take five or 10 minutes and it gives you a nice snapshot uh, of, is there a risk of something? If the test is positive, that is, there's a, a lower score than expected, then that should trigger the next step, which is either your physician themselves could do a more detailed evaluation or they could refer you to a specialist like a neurologist who specializes in brain health. Um, uh, and they could do a much more extensive evaluation looking to see, one, is this a decline? Does it represent a dementia? And then two, more importantly, what's the most likely cause? Is the cause Alzheimer's? Is the cause Parkinson's? Is the cause due to strokes? Is the cause due to medications? Is the cause due to other medical conditions? Because the treatment plan is going to be different for the different conditions. Um, so there's a screening step and then there's the more detailed evaluation. This is a, a bit of a twofold question. So can COVID cause memory loss and dementia? And I know that you refer to the vascular changes and other organs that we still don't even know what COVID causes. And then here's the second part. Is there something called COVID brain? And there has been some publicity about that. Right. So I'll answer the second part first. So um, what we know is that in some cases, there have been some changes in the brain, particularly the small blood vessels in the brain associated, seem to be associated specifically with COVID. So some of the people who have died, who have all had autopsies, they've had changes in their brain that they've attributed directly to, to COVID virus. Um, so there appears to be a COVID effect on the brain um, this first part's harder uh, because it's very difficult to know exactly how someone's going to respond to COVID. And, and if you've read any of the articles on COVID, I mean, just about every possible symptom that could ever occur in any condition has been attributed at, at, to COVID. So everything from tingly fingers to loss of taste to memory loss to dizziness, et cetera. So, you know, it's always very, very difficult to attribute something without more research. And so there are lots of people doing this now. There are lots of programs to try to study the effects of COVID. Um, I will say that if someone has COVID and they start to develop a memory problem, um, it's possible that the COVID could have acted as a stress test, right? So people had sort of underlying disease and they didn't, it wasn't manifest yet. Um, and then COVID was the unmasking event, right? So think about this. If you go see a cardiologist and they're checking your heart and they put you on the treadmill and they, you do a stress test and you're exercising and all of a sudden your EKG changes, um, that's a stress test. In other words, the exercise brought out the cardiac deficit. Um, well, COVID could be acting sort of as a brain stress test. Um, and so in some individuals who have gotten COVID, they appear to now look like they have Alzheimer's disease, and it's possible that it wasn't directly COVID, but rather COVID sort of unmasking the, the event. So, but we don't know. The, the fact is we just don't know yet. We're, we still need more research and more understanding of what's happening. 
Reference diabetes, which you have said is definitely one of the highest risk factors. Does it matter if it's type one or two, if it's controlled, and then people all doing this keto-based diet to cut down on sugar, could that be helpful? Right. So, so diabetes is a risk factor. Um, people who are diet-controlled diabetes don't seem to be at a higher risk than the general population. Um, if you require medications to treat your diabetes, either an oral medicine or insulin, it does put you at a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, the idea is to, uh, the tighter the control of your diabetes, the lower the complication rate of your diabetes. And that's been pretty well established for many, many years, back when I was in medical school. Um, and, and so you want to always try to reduce the risk of your complications associated with your diabetes. Um, but if you have diabetes, you are at a higher risk. Again, that doesn't mean you're going to get the disease, the Alzheimer's disease, but it just puts you at a higher risk. That means that you should do everything you can to make sure your diabetes is, is well controlled. Um, in terms of diets, things like keto diets, um, you know, there have been some small studies looking at the keto diet and memory, um, and it appears to have some positive effect on memory, but it's not a sustainable diet. So there are very few people who can maintain a ketogenic diet because, um, well, one, it's not a very tasty diet, and two, it's, it's very difficult not to take in, um, you know, carbohydrates. Uh, so the fat profile from taking a keto diet is not necessarily always favorable, um, and there's carbohydrates are so rampant in everything that we eat, it does make it really difficult to maintain. Um, so in laboratory rats, it's very easy to put them on a keto diet, but it's really difficult to keep people on a keto diet for an extended period of time. Um, so, so it appears to have a, an effect in and of itself, but it's not maintainable for the most part. Right. So it, it couldn't hurt, but not for a, a long time. I would suggest the keto diet is not the way to go. If you want to do a diet uh, or dietary approach, uh, there's a diet uh, called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. Uh, which is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So a Mediterranean diet and antihypertensive diet. And I think that's the strongest evidence. And the beauty of following a, a lifestyle diet like the mine is you're still allowed to have a dessert, right? So it's not dieting. We're not talking about dieting. We're talking about changing our lifestyle and our approach to food. That's right. Um, how long does it take the progression of dementia to go from mild to severe or what I guess is considered end stage because right. essentially dementia kills, doesn't right. it? Yes. So Alzheimer's and all of the dementias are fatal diseases. Everybody, no one will survive their Alzheimer's disease at the present time. Um, it varies widely by individuals depending on how old you are when you get it, what's your general health, and what are your financial and social resources. So there's a lot of factors that come into play. Um, so there are very malignant, in quotations, looking cases of Alzheimer's disease that start to finish are three to six months. And there are cases that 25 years later, people are still alive. Um, in general, the median, so that's the 50th percentile, it is about in the eight to 10 year range for the disease uh, from start to finish. But that's a that has two very long tails at either end of that curve. Uh, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, the healthier you are, the better you do. The more resources and, and social support you have, the better you do. Um, you know, the older you are, the better you do. The disease tends to be a little less malignant if you're very old when you develop it as opposed to when you're younger. But that may have more to do with when you're younger, you have more to lose uh, than when you're older in terms of um, some measurable activities. So if you were working and get the disease, you lose your job. It's a much more devastating disease than if you're 96 and not working and have a memory problem. So um, there, are, there are variations. And so it's very difficult to give a set number. Is um, a brain scan, a CAT scan, an MRI, are any of those screening tools helpful to detect dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera? So the work, the recommended workup for Alzheimer's and related disorders is to have an image of the brain, uh, preferably an MRI. If not an MRI, then a CT scan. 
The MRI gives us a lot more information, so it's much better, and we can see parts of the brain uh, uh, in much more detail on an MRI than we can see on a CAT scan. But if you can't do an MRI, if you have a pacemaker, for example, or you're very claustrophobic, or you live in an area where there are not MRIs, doesn't sound like that you know, in Miami, but if you go out into the middle of the country, there are very far distances when you can't find an MRI. Um, than a, a CAT scan will do. So we, do, we, use the, we use the imaging for two things. So one, we want to rule out other causes. So we want to look for strokes or for head injury, for tumors, for things like that. And we want to rule in patterns of brain shrinkage or atrophy that are somewhat diagnostic. So there's a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. So it looks like a little seahorse. Um, and it's the seat of your short-term memory. It's one of the earliest areas of the brain to change in Alzheimer's disease. And so we can look at the MRI and see shrinkage there. And if we see someone with memory loss and shrinkage of their hippocampus, that tells us that it's like, statistically, it's likely to be Alzheimer's disease. So we use it for both a rule out and a rule in uh, procedure to try to help us make a better diagnosis. I know we talked about the Mediterranean diet and healthy eating and exercise and so forth. Any vitamin supplements that can help brain cells and keep them healthier? No. So I want to say flat. Anything you can buy over the counter has no evidence that it does anything, except really it has evidence for two things. One, it makes really expensive urine um, because your body can't store it and can't use it, so it just pees it out. Um, and two, it makes money for the person who sold it to you. But that's really the only thing that it actually does. Every bottle that claims everything that it claims, if you take the bottle, turn it to the back, and look at the bottom of the back label, the last two lines will all say two things. The first, as these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, which means every other statement they've said has never been evaluated. And two, this product is not intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure a disease. So if something is not intended to diagnose a disease, treat a disease, prevent a disease, or cure a disease, what's it for? It's for nothing. So none of those over-the-counter products have any benefit whatsoever. Now, in terms of vitamins, vitamins you can get from your diet if you eat a balanced diet. If for some reason you're, you have a restricted diet, then taking a vitamin might make sense. So for example, if you're a vegan, vitamin B12 is really only found in animal products. So if you're a pure vegan and you take no animal products whatsoever, you might need a B12 supplement. Um, if you're um, a, woman, a woman and you're still menstruating, um, you, know, you may have periods where you have some iron deficiency anemia, um, and so taking iron supplements might make sense. Um, if you have a gastric problem and you have difficulty producing stomach acid, um, you might not produce enough intrinsic factor, which is necessary to absorb vitamin B12. So in select cases, supplementing with vitamins makes sense. Um, if you eat a healthy and balanced diet, there's not a lot of need to take additional vitamins. Your body can't store B vitamins, so they're water soluble. So you take a thousand units of Vitamin C, you're urinating out 990 of them yeah. uh, because you don't need it. I think the final question is the most appropriate one given this topic. And what is the best thing that we can do to support a friend, a family member, anyone we know in our inner circle struggling with dementia and memory loss right now? During right. COVID? Uh, well, the first thing is give them a hug, right? If you can't give them a real hug, give them a virtual hug. Um, I, I think. Um, we, we as a society, not you as individuals, but we as a society, um, look at older adults with these type of problems and we, we, we stigmatize them, we ostracize them, we treat them as something less than what they once were. Um, and, and so I think, you know, giving people the respect that they deserve, showing them the love and affection that they deserve is, is really, uh, um, an under, understated uh, first step. Um, two, what you can do to support them is make sure that they're properly diagnosed and that their disease is properly managed, right? So I said in the beginning, dementia is not a diagnosis. 
you want to know what the cause of the dementia is so that you can plan appropriately. You can be on the right treatments and you can do advanced care planning. Um, so that's important to get a correct diagnosis. Then three is that you wanna manage all of the comorbid conditions, right? So if you have Alzheimer's and diabetes or Alzheimer's and COPD, you're gonna have worse outcomes than if you had COPD alone. So you wanna make sure that you're managing all of those uh, conditions well uh, because um, they, they interact with each other and the effect is more than additive, it's synergistic. So it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals three. Um, and so getting good management of all of that. And third is uh, to think about the future. So do long-term care planning, right? Um, have an advanced directive, have a, prox a healthcare proxy, have a durable power of attorney. Um, if you don't have a problem, think about whether you can afford long-term care insurance, uh, things that can help you prepare for caring for yourself and your loved ones um, in the future. Um, and the last thing is seek out support. Um, you know, join a support group, join an advocacy group, join the Alzheimer's Association, walk in the Alzheimer walk, um, support research. Uh, these are the things that we can do to eventually have a world without Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Galvin. I, our program has got to wrap up at this point and we regret if we didn't answer all your questions, but thank you for being an interactive and wonderful audience. And thank you, Dr. Galvin, for an excellent presentation of giving us tangibles and take home messages that we can really use in our life right away. Well, thank you everybody. Have a pleasant evening. And, and remember, it's not really social distancing, it's just physical distancing, still be social. Right. And, and like Dr. Galvin, we, you help appreciate your participation. Remember, we're here for you. So please don't forget to visit umiamihealth.org. And that way you can learn more about virtual in-person appointments with Dr. Galvin, with any of our providers and experts. And also please complete the survey at the end of this talk to give us feedback on your experience. We thank you for joining us again. Please stay safe out there, wear your mask, and have a great evening. Good night. Bye-bye.